There we go. Okay, thank you. Well, it's an honor to commemorate Georges Lemaitre um, at this academy where he found so much a home. In fact, Lemaitre told us, Le monde est une belle histoire, que chaque génération s'efforce d'améliorer. In that spirit, I thought I'd take the occasion to provide a little context behind his pioneering contributions to cosmology, which, as you will see, in many ways laid a foundation for many of the ideas that we heard about this afternoon, and which perhaps indirectly also provides an understanding of his presidency of this academy. So, to set the scene, the history of relativistic cosmology can roughly be divided into six periods, going from the initial explorations by Einstein and Willem de Sitter in 1917, to the precision science we have today. Lemaitre's contributions must be situated in the second crucial period in which the basic framework of modern cosmology was established. Lemaitre himself traces his interests to science and cosmology to his childhood, which he spent in the south of Belgium. Unfortunately, World War I intervened, and together with his brother, he signed up to join the Belgian army to defend his country. After the war, he entered seminary for the priesthood, and he was ordained as a priest in 1923. While at the seminary, however, he was granted special permission by Cardinal Mercier to study Einstein's new theory of relativity. And he wrote a dissertation while at the seminary on the early applications of relativity to cosmology. On the basis of that dissertation, he was granted a travel uh, grant to go study abroad. And that was the beginning of a unique scientific adventure for Lemaitre. His first destination was the University of Cambridge, where he deepened his knowledge of relativity, studying mainly with uh, Arthur Eddington, one of the foremost astronomers at the time. Later, Eddington would write that he found in Lemaitre a truly brilliant student, wonderfully quick and clear-sighted, and of great mathematical ability. And coming from Eddington, this is really saying something. Lemaitre's next destination was Harvard and MIT. He spent a year in America visiting the major U.S. observatories at, an, at a unique time in the history where the first observations were coming in that would challenge the age-old idea of a static eternal universe. In particular, Lemaitre was present at the American Astronomical Society meeting where Russell announces Hubble's discovery that spiral nebulae are, in fact, other distant galaxies. In other words, the universe was much, much larger than was at the time uh, assumed. Lemaitre also, for the first time, works on cosmology. In particular, he studies the redshift in uh, Willem de Sitter's universe. But the Sitter's universe was empty. There are no galaxies in the Sitter's universe, and there are no observers. Therefore, Lemaitre abandons this model. After that year, he returned to Belgium. He takes up a faculty position at the Catholic Universiteit Leuven in uh, the physics building that you see there. But he continued to think about cosmology, and he continued to think in particular whether relativity, whether Einstein's theory, could, in some, could somehow accommodate the latest observations showing the reddening of the distance nebula. In other words, can relativity made to be compatible with the observations? Is there a universe which is somehow in between Einstein's static world, which has matter and galaxies, and the sitter's empty world in which you would find a redshift? And Lebedre's stroke of genius then is to abandon the notion of a static universe. And he does so in 1927 in this paper, um, which he chose to publish in a low-impact Belgian journal, written in French, 
Um, and in this paper, he establishes the fundamental connection between Einstein's theory of relativity and cosmology. In particular, he finds a solution of Einstein's theory, which interpolates in time between Einstein's static universe in the far past and the sitter's empty universe in the far future. So on the horizontal axis, you have time. On the vertical axis, you have roughly the size of the universe. So that was the first model of an evolving, of a dynamical universe um, put forward. In the same paper, he establishes that if our world were like this, then we would indeed see distant galaxies shifted, the light of distant galaxies shifted to the red. And in, he has an equation, equation 24, in which he explicitly derives what later would become known as the Hubble law. Evidently, the data to support his prediction were very scattered, were uncertain. Lemaitre, in a typical sort of pragmatic, low-key manner, simply takes the average redshift and the average distance and divides between all, between all the sample of the, the entire sample of galaxies and arrives at a specific number for the expansion rate. Now, Lemaitre's idea of an expanding universe did not go down very well with the scientific community. In fact, later in 1927, he meets Einstein for the first time in the margin of the Solveig conference in Brussels, where Einstein says, tells him, well, your calculations are correct, but your physical insight is tout à fait abominable. But, as you know, two years later, Hubble establishes observationally, with more precise data, the linear relation between distance and redshift. And at that point, evidently, the scientific community is very much aware that there is something serious at stake for relativity. Therefore, the reddening of the nebulae is very much high on the agenda at the January 10 meeting in 1930 at the Royal Society, Royal Astronomical Society in London, where both Eddington and the Sitter really put forward the pressing issue whether relativity can be made compatible with, um, the observa with Hubble's observations. It is only at that point that Lemaitre reacts and writes Eddington uh, saying that he had found a solution to this problem three years earlier. And on the right, you see um, the manuscript that Lemaitre sends to Eddington, which Eddington passes on to the sitter. And Eddington writes a little note on the, in the top left corner saying, well, this seems to be a complete solution to the problem we were discussing. And from then onwards, Eddington, the sitter, the whole astro-relativity community uh, is very much on board with the idea of an expanding universe, and eventually also Einstein concedes. But whenever one is on board, Lemaitre is already one giant step further. These are the first, the first known sketches of Lemaitre's dynamical universes. And you see a whole range of universes there, some of which expand, and that contract, others keep on expanding. But they share one feature, which is they don't have an infinite past anymore. Meanwhile, while the scientific community was getting used to the notion of expanding universe, Lemaitre had just excised Einstein's infinite static past from uh, his model of cosmology and replaced this with a genuine origin. You see that if you go back in time on that graph, space, the universe gets smaller, and because time is welded to space in relativity, you arrive at a genuine origin. In a way, Einstein's relativity, when extrapolated backwards in time, predicts its own downfall. It predicts, as Robert was saying earlier today, that there is a singularity. Now, what does that mean? We don't really know, but one thing we do know is that our usual, usual notions of space and time no longer apply. 
All, overall, I think you can say that in these early days of the discovery of the expansion of the universe, Lemaitre, much more than his contemporaries, embraced the notion of evolution. Cosmic evolution was just much more central in Lemaitre's thinking than um, anyone else at the time, I believe. Now, that beginning, um, well, here's another quote of Lemaitre, and so he compares that origin, uh, he compares space-time to an open conic cup. The bottom of the cup is the origin of atomic disintegration. It's the first instant at the bottom of space-time, the now which has no yesterday, because yesterday there was no space. That's a prime example of Lemaitre's uh, semi-poetic uh, way of uh, doing science. And so he called that beginning primeval atom. And in fact, he set out his vision of the origin of the universe most clearly and perhaps most visionary in a small paper which he published in Nature um, in 1931. Um, called the beginning of the world from the point of view of quantum theory. This paper is very gently, very carefully written, almost poetic, and in fact it's, it's incidentally, it's assigned in his own name with his home address, not his university's address, and it's written as a response to an earlier statement made by Eddington a couple of months earlier, which I'm showing at the bottom there, where Eddington essentially claimed that any notion of the beginning of the world is repugnant to him. Lemaitre, in his small nature paper, offers a resolution to Eddington's. So Eddington's reasoning was that, well, if you go back to the beginning, then surely this is going to require an infinite amount of organization to get the world going in just the right way. Lemaitre offers a resolution to this problem by appealing to quantum theory, by appealing to the uncertainty, to the indeterminacy of quantum theory. Lemaitre was looking for a natural physical beginning out of which a, com a complex cosmos could conceivably emerge. And that is exactly what current um, inflationary cosmology uh, effect is implementing. Eh? Another thing which is important to realize is that above all for a beginning for Lemaitre was also a kind of frontier as to what is the region of the universe, what is the realm of reality with which we can have any observational contact. So in a way his, his primeval atom is also a sort of attempt to specify a kind of horizon in cosmology beyond which we cannot have any observational ac uh, access. Interestingly, Lemaitre realized when he was going to evoke quantum theory that he was not going to get a unique world. He ends this paper in the following way. Clearly, the initial quantum could not conceal in itself the whole course of evolution. The story of the world needs not have been written down in the first quantum like the song on a disc of a phonograph. Instead, from the same beginning, widely different universes could have evolved. So that's a precursor, really, of modern uh, quantum cosmology or modern multiverse uh, ideas. Now, you will not be surprised after hearing Einstein's reaction to the expanding universe that Einstein wasn't keen on the notion of a beginning. After all, it implied the breakdown of his own theory. And indeed, um, Lemaitre and Einstein had a lot of correspondence in the early 30s, but Einstein would very much um, keep any notion of a beginning uh, at a distance. In fact, he complained to our Belgian priest that this reminded him too much of the Christian dogma. But here we have a Belgian priest trying to make clear that religion and theology is very different from, trying, from describing the physical origin of the universe. And incidentally, the paper that I'm showing there ends with those words, but at the archives of Lemaitre, you find the manuscript of this paper. And the manuscript of this paper contains an extra, an additional paragraph, all the way at the end, which Lemaitre crossed out before publication. 
and there it is. So all the way at the end, Le Maitre writes, I think that everyone who believes in the Supreme Being, supporting every being and every acting, believes also that God is essentially hidden and may be glad to see how present physics provides a veil hiding the creation. Here you clearly see that Le Maitre's analysis, Le Maitre's insistency that the physical origin of our world should be part of science, which is the key point of this paper, is distinct and compatible with his theology. In fact, a constant theme in Le Maitre's theology is the reference to Jesaja's Deus Absconditus. So what he means by that veil is really we should be, that is, is to make a dis distinction between dis physically describing the emergence of notions of space and time versus um, asking transcendental or metaphysical uh, questions. He maintains that position clearly uh, for the rest of his life. And in, here is just an example. In 1958, when he chairs the cosmology session at the Conseil Solvay in Brussels, he writes, the hot Big Bang model is nothing but a scientific hypothesis to be verified or falsified by observations and remains entirely outside the realm of metaphysics or religion. He is very clear on this constantly. And in a way, I believe it also provides some of an understanding of his activities as president of this Pontifical Academy of Sciences, where he carefully and meticulously ma maintained the autonomy of science and religion as two harmoniously coexisting spheres distinct in their methodology. He also, I believe, presided over a significant broadening internationally and as far as disciplines is concerned at uh, the Pontifical Academy. Does this mean that philosophy has absolutely nothing to say about cosmology for Le Maitre? I think the answer is not at all. Le Maitre never attempted to make any conceptual link between the two or provide, never provided any theoretical bridge. But clearly his life and his actions were very much reflect a unity between these two dimensions of his life, what he would call two ways to the truth. So you're not going to find any official or public statement about any link. But look at his diaries. This is one page which I took out of his diary. On the left page, you see a description of his favorite cosmological model, an expanding universe and so forth. On the right page, there is um, a discussion of, in fact, a medieval Flemish spiritual thinker. These two aspects of his life are constantly intertwined in his diaries and really make Le Maitre, through his actions, who he was. Now, in the early 30s, Le Maitre and many other people at that time, Tolman um, and so forth, consolidated that early picture would, which, would, which would become the foundation of, of, of our modern uh, Big Bang theory. Um, and in, in, interestingly, Le Maitre settled on this particular model of cosmology. A universe, in other words, which expands fast, initially, which then goes through a slow period of expansion, and finally accelerates again. Beautifully visionary, and as Saul told us, it turns out to be the universe in which we happen to be. It's also interesting why Le Maitre settled on this universe. Because you might think, well, it's not the simplest universe. And indeed, this is a little more complicated than, than what you might have wished for. Le Maitre settled on this universe because he thought there better be enough time for galaxies and stars and planets and complexity to develop. In order to have enough time, given 
his value of the expansion that he could measure, that, 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 that Hubble found, he needed this flat plateau, he needed that decelerating phase in the middle. So Lemaitre reason, and this is pure Lemaitre, this is really pure Lemaitre, Lemaitre reasons here in a sort of subtle magic sphere between theory on the one hand and the obvious fact that we have to exist in the universe on the other hand. He sort of naturally takes into account our existence in these very early models of the universe which he built. Now, that final phase of accelerated expansion that you see there can, um, is realized in Lemaitre's model by the cosmological constant, little lambda at a time, which uh, Jim and Sol already told you about. Lemaitre kept this. In contrast to Einstein, Lemaitre always kept lambda, and he regarded lambda as a bridge between relativity and quantum theory. In a way, he regarded lambda as sort of the ultimate connection between the infinite small on the one hand and the infinite large on the other hand. Which may well be true. Per lambda, we have already, we, we now have observed the cosmological constant. We don't really know where it's coming from. But it might well be, in my opinion, that with a better understanding of quantum gravity, that this understanding of quantum gravity may tell us something more about this cosmological constant. Put differently, we may already have made an observation, namely the value of the cosmological constant, which tells us perhaps something about the true quantum origin of our universe. So to sum up what are the key ingredients of Lemaitre's hesitating universe which he settled on, it's an expanding universe with a cosmological constant and a quantum origin that, he concluded, should come with some relic radiation. There should be, in his words, um, some fossil radiation left over from that very early hot uh, epoch of the universe. And I let, I let that describe to you by himself, if the movie can start, here is a little um, part of an interview he gave. Uh, ah, but it comes without sound, yeah. <laughs> so that's in Dutch, eh? Um, c'est que le, une partie des rayons ont échappé, ne comptant presque pas d'hydrogène, et que ces rayons peuvent se retrouver, et que l'on peut espérer qu'ils se trouvent, dans les rayons cosmiques. C'est une théorie qui a été avancée, non seulement par moi-même, mais par Regener, il y a bien longtemps, qui les appelait, qui appelait les rayons, les rayons cosmiques des rayons fossiles, en ce sens, qui sont des témoignages des tout premiers âges du monde, et que pour ma part, je préférais appeler les rayons du feu d'artifice primitif, uh, qui se sont conservés dans l'espace remarquablement vite et nous parviennent en nous témoignant, en nous donnant un témoignage des premiers âges du monde. Évidemment, un peu de poésie là-dedans. So he talks about the fossil radiation left over from the early primeval stages. That interview was recorded we believe in 61 or 62, um, before evidently the discovery of um, that uh, fossil radiation. Lemaitre settled on this model of cosmology um, around 34, 35, and then never really worked again on cosmology. In fact, he did other things, he became pretty much obsessed with computing and he established the first computing center in, in Leuven. And then he also famously turned down a huge grant from the US Department of Energy to expand that computing center um, because he was not never interested in, in building, building up big centers. Uh, in any case, um, the, his, yeah, the, as, as was discussed, the, his model of, the, of cosmology was essentially uh, observationally vindicated um, by the discovery uh, by Penzias and Wilson of the background radiation and the cosmological interpretation given by Jim Peebles and his colleagues. 
Lemaitre learned about that discovery a mere three, de three days before he died. Um, he was, he, a colleague of his visited him in the hospital and he replied, oh, je suis content, maintenant on a la preuve. Thank you. <laughs>